Hi everyone, we're just waiting for all of the people that have registered to join. So thanks for being with us today. And we'll just wait for all of the magic to happen for it to go live so that everyone can get on. That's looking good. So thank you very much for joining us for session two of our virtual conference. Um, as you, those of you that were here on the first session, you will have heard that this is a very exciting partnership and opportunity for ISAP South Africa to uh, deliver this series of uh, plenary sessions, of which this is the second, and focusing on evidence-based prevention. So I'm going to shortly hand over to uh, your moderator for today's session. But just so that you all know, um, any questions that you have during the presentations, please pop them in the questions box, which is part of the GoToWebinar platform. And we'll be collating those and put those to the speakers at the end of the session. There will be the short Q&A um, opportunity at the end of today's session. We will be sharing a recording of this webinar and all of the presentations and any um, key resources that are mentioned on the ISAP website. So keep your eyes open for that. There is interpretation available. So if you look in the chat function, you will see the languages available and the links that you can follow to get the live interpretation. And just to say that all of you who have registered for today, will have been invited to a network on the ISAP website, which is an online um, sort of forum, if you like, where you can ask questions and chat about the event and today's plenary session in particular. So please make use of that as well. And all that's left to me to say is thank you very much for joining us again this week. Thank you to our speakers who you will be seeing throughout the session. And I would like to now hand over to David Bayava, who is your moderator for today. Good afternoon, everybody. And I greet you from an overcast Johannesburg, but welcome you all to this, our second plenary of the ISAP Global Africa Virtual Conference. I'll be chairing today's session ably assisted, as you've heard, by our support team from ISAP Global. So I'm not flying solo, but during today's plenary, we will hear from esteemed panelists of experts on the subject of evidence-based prevention, and I'm looking at policy and practice. By way of introduction, I'm David Baver and a steering committee member of the newly launched ISAP chapter in South Africa. I'm also the current chairperson of the Central Drug Authority in South Africa and a director of the South African Institute for Drug Free Sport and a member of their education committee. I also serve as a lecturer and a researcher in the Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Edwardes-Rand Medical School. At the outset, I would like to acknowledge the contribution and the support that has been and made this virtual conference possible. And judging by the number of attendees and participants who joined our first plenary, we are heartened by all of their efforts. ISAP South Africa is excited to partner not only with ISAP Global, but also with the African Union Commission, South African National Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependence, better known as SANCA, the Department of Social Development for the Republic of South Africa, Organizations of American States Inter-American Drug Abuse Control Commission and the U.S. Department of State Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs. Without all of their support, this Global Africa Virtual Conference would not be taking place. By way of introduction, it has been well recognized and a stated and accepted principle that prevention is the most effective way of bringing about change. And we acknowledge that the early use of drugs increases a person's chances of developing a substance use disorder. So preventing early use of drug, alcohol and tobacco will go a long way in preventing the risks. The risk of drug use increases greatly during times of transition and changes as we have just witnessed with COVID-19 pandemic. 
for an adult, a divorce or a loss of a job may increase the risk of drug use. And for teenagers, risky times, including moving, witnessing the gender-based violence and changing from the schooling routines that they have been used to, is a time where they have less structured involvement in learning at school and children may be exposed to substance use. When they are at high school, teens may be encouraged with great availability of the drugs to experiment and social activities where drugs are used will also help them to experiment. When individuals leave high school, and live more independently, either in colleges or as, as employed adults, they may find themselves exposed to drug use while separated from the protective structures provided by the family and the school. A certain amount of risk taking is a normal part of adolescent development. The desire to try new things and become more independent is healthy, but it may also increase tendencies to experiment with unknown drugs. Because the brain is still developing, Using drugs at this early stage has more potential to disrupt brain functions in areas critical to the motivational, memory, learning, judgment, and behavior controls. So we are all looking forward to learning about prevention from our esteemed panelists. I would like to then introduce our first presenter, Jeff Lee. Jeff was an ISAP first executive director having worked as executive director of Mentor International. Before that, Jeff was the director of the Advisory Council for Alcohol and Drug Education at a UK national NGO based in Manchester. He has previously worked with Applied Prevention Science International and was project manager for the European Drug Prevention Quality Standards Phase Two project at Liverpool John Moore University. Jeff has a master's degree in human relationships and as asserts the role of education and the need to promote personal and social skills as a key element to tackling substance use prevention and to address the factors that result in problematic health behaviors. Jeff has worked in more than 80 countries as a consultant to governments, the EU, WHO and the UNODC with an emphasis in the field of personal, social, and life skills education. He has also written and contributed to a number of publications in the field of health and drug education. A senior consultant for ISAP, his focus is to support the establishment development and support for its national chapters. Please tell us, Jeff, what constitutes evidence-based prevention? Over to you. I hope you can hear me. Um, David, thank you very much. Are you sure that was me you were describing? It sounded too impressive. Uh, I definitely didn't recognize myself, but thank you for those very kind words. Uh, and thank you all listeners for your time and interest in this issue. Um, because of a, a little problem in getting the slides, I'm gonna to have to keep saying next slide to my colleagues. So next slide, please. The challenge for me is uh, to try and answer the question, uh, what constitutes evidence-based prevention? Um, we talk about it a lot, um, but perhaps now and again, we have to come back and check out what do we really mean when we use that term. Next. Um, there's a, a little bit of death by PowerPoint, and I'm sorry my slides are not uh, as good as many of my colleagues so i've gone back to a, a standard of, of just trying to keep it uh, as relatively simple um isop's focus is the professionalization of the drug demand reduction workforce uh, and our key focus is to promote evidence-based high quality ethical policy and practice and evidence base again uh, comes out as the key phrase we use uh, 
so what constitutes evidence-based? And that's one of many questions I'm going to ask, probably asking more questions than answers as I will give. So let's try and unwrap what constitutes evidence base. Next slide. Um, and I suppose the starting point for me is where does prevention fit in the whole drug demand reduction effort? And next slide. Uh, and some apologies for those of you that have seen uh, my long uh, analogy, long standing analogy about the team effort in drug demand reduction and, and substance use professional uh, FC football club. Uh, and we know that we've got um, the forward line of supply control, tremendous amount of money being paid to address the issue of substance use um in customs law and order etc um and then but we know that's never going to be totally successful so we have our defense where we've got treatment uh, and we've got and my slides have disappeared um so i don't know what's happened to my slides and there they are of, of treatment and recovery and self-help uh, but sadly two people go through the defense uh, and so for me the key is the, uh, the the midfield where we have prevention uh, we have education we have the need for health promotion and that central midfield the end room is one that gets not so much recognition not so much money spent on it but i think it's fundamental and it's evidence-based prevention that we're trying to achieve to make that midfield uh, the most uh, effective next slide just to say we have the opposition that we have to team up against and we could add covid to that list but you can see it's a significant uh, group of uh, problems that we have to address and challenge if our team is to be effective and to uh, and to win at least some if not most of the matches next slide So what I'd like to do is to look at a range of questions. Um, what is evidence or evidence-based? What are the definitions we're using? Are they the right ones? Um, what about prevention? Um, finding evidence to achieve something that doesn't happen is always going to be a challenge because what we want is for things not to happen. And I'd like to raise the suggestion about are we always talking about evidence based practice or is there something we should consider about practice based evidence? And then how can we respond to the challenges that the issue of evidence based and evidence based prevention uh, raises for us? Next slide, please. So just a couple of definitions when I looked up and said, what does evidence mean? And I've just got this, the available body of facts or information indicating whether a belief or proposition is true or valid. So we're into what is truth. Um, and if we can find the answer to that, uh, a challenge we've had for many centuries. Um, so what is true in terms of prevention and what are the facts or information is the stress here but it could be a sign which shows that something exists or is true it is another suggestion and then i came across this interesting uh, concept of evidence um, from the sort of legal nature of of what evidence means next slide and found that they listed 15 types of evidence uh, and I don't intend to go through them, but I'm sure you'll recognize some of them, the forensic evidence, but then the circumstantial evidence and often documentary evidence or hearsay. And do these count as evidence or where do they fit in terms of our concept of evidence-based prevention? Next slide. I looked at the term evidence-based and that was interesting in the difference it threw up in saying that it denoted, a, a denate, uh, denoted an approach to medicine, education and other disciplines 
that emphasize the practical applications of the findings of the best available current research. Uh, uh, and I really uh, was in tune with this definition because my uh, uh, career, I think, has been trying to say how can we translate what we find in research and, and in all the theory and research and put that into actual practice. Um, and what is the best available? It, and that's an interesting term, I think, when we look at what we mean by evidence base. And, and just to add again, um, when it comes to evidence base for prevention, um, to prove that something you do results in something not happening is not easy. Next slide. So how can we begin to prove prevention? Um, we need perhaps to look at the components that, that go towards preventing things. What are the factors that contribute to prevention? Can we break it down? And I suggest that the key is to try and be clear on what are our objectives in prevention and then identifying ways of finding out if they have been achieved. Can we identify positive and realistic objectives that can be evaluated and or measured if we're going to prove that prevention works? Next slide. Obviously, before we start, we may need to just refresh our uh, understanding when we talk about drug prevention. Um, the whole issue of terminology in this whole area is, is a difficult one and can cause lots of discussions. But when we talk about drugs or substances, uh, I think we perhaps do need to consider what are we talking about? Are we talking about all psychoactive substances? Are we talking about specific drugs? Where do the substances like alcohol and tobacco uh, fit into our uh, discussions and research? Uh, and they obviously are major health and problem related drugs uh, 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 among the, uh, the, the illegal drugs. Uh, and of course, it, it's interesting that now at least we're seeing drugs as a public health and education issue and not uh, one that ha has to have a law and order focus. So in our objectives, I think we have to consider those points. So what is our ultimate objective? I think if we ask most people, they would say, well, we've got to either stop people using or misusing drugs or avoid and, and tackle substance use disorders, or we have to stop people from starting to use drugs in the first place. And again, we could have a long discussion over the terms like use uh, and misuse uh, and abuse and what is the right terminology. But I think we can all share what our objective is in terms of avoiding um, substance use disorders and all the harm that drug use can cause to drug users and to society and to friends and family, etc. Next slide. And if that's our ultimate objective, perhaps we can look at it in terms of what are the intermediate objectives that can allow us to reach that ultimate objective, because going straight for the ultimate objective can be very challenging and difficult. Um, so perhaps look at the objectives required to, to address prevention-focused activities in different settings. Uh, the environment, family, community, school, media, workplace. They're the areas where we need to look at uh, where prevention has a, has a place and what are the objectives we want in those settings. Uh, and another area is to address specific objectives with respect to factors that contribute to achieving that ultimate objective. So, we need to address issues of availability of personal and social skills and competencies, uh, a look at risk and protective factors, look at issues uh, concerned with behaviour change. And if we can take uh, uh, the objectives and break them down into smaller pieces, um, perhaps they will be seen to contribute to our ultimate objective and give us the evidence 
um, that can build towards that ultimate objective. Next slide. So how do we then find the evidence that an objective has been achieved and that what we are doing actually works? Well, obviously we rely heavily on research and therefore finding the evidence that the research will bring. But it still poses the question of what constitutes acceptable research and what constitutes acceptable evidence. Um, where do we say the line is drawn uh, in terms of this being acceptable? Is there a place, for example, of looking at practice-based evidence that is evidence based on experience more than measurement. And I know many colleagues in our university would say no, um, but I think it's an interesting challenge where often uh, the research is difficult to undertake. We'll say more about that in a moment. So are there other types of evidence that we need to take on board? Is that list of the 15 something that we should consider? Next slide. So, question, should we review the way we address evidence in our understanding of prevention? Should it accept different types of evidence rather than the more focused definition of evidence-based? Do we or can we have the gold card evidence, the forensic, the RCT, the controlled trials as the high standard of evidence? Um, but can we also see where the place of the iron card evidence is anecdotal evidence and other types of evidence, something we consider? And where do we draw that line and what is acceptable as evidence? Do we only accept the gold card and reject other um, ways of people that will tell us things work. Next slide. I, I just add this slide because I think the other thing for me is that when we talk about the gold card of evidence and the need to have the truth of what works, um, the reality is that we can't always get to the top of the stairs straight away. Um, but if we can move people forward a step at a time in finding out, um, then that's the aspiration that we're trying to meet for people to improve how they go about their prevention work and base it more on evidence until they can reach the gold card standard. Again, on my football analogy, my own team might not reach the level of, of Liverpool, but it doesn't stop them trying. Um, and even my own town of Loughborough um, might reach some of our colleagues in Nigeria or Uganda or South Africa one day, but at least they're trying to do so. Everyone wants to progress, and I think that's the challenge for prevention and for the evidence-based model. Next slide, please. So, as I've said, we need the gold card, we need the randomized control trial. We know that is the best way if we can do our work based on that. But I think we have to also accept that there's a cost involved in that. There's a need for relevant expertise, for opportunity. There are often ethical considerations that have to go into uh, any sort of uh, RCT approach. We know there are other research methods um, that we can use to find the evidence, um, but are they good enough or where do we draw the line on the other uh, non-gold card ways of doing our research? And there are other considerations even from the research findings that we have. Um, so people will often say, well, if it works in one country, culture, setting, situation, does it mean it will apply in others? Uh, or another one, uh, um, can the greenhouse research have the same effects when applied on a mass scale? And often we talk about fidelity uh, to the way we work. Well, is that a realistic expectation? 
So for me, I, I suggest we need to consider what, a, what is research realistic, particularly for developing countries. Are we asking too much uh, and perhaps missing out on some of the objectives that are being achieved, but not being measured, uh, and therefore that they're often rejected? Certainly my own experience in Uganda uh, would indicate some of the work that went on there may not have had the RCT, but I would challenge people to say it wasn't working. Next slide. So, um, in spite of that, we need to consider uh, where we draw the line and what is acceptable evidence. Uh, the reality of what Joe Public and Peter Policy believe and what results in investment in prevention is often based on other things than research and evidence. People will often invest in it because of just anecdotal feedback of perceived impact or effect, or because they like it and it's good op photo opportunity, or it looks and sounds good. It's a good website and singing and dancing approach and sounds really effective. Um, and it responds to our often people's instinctive views of what will work because it's a, a shock horror approach or just say no. So we have to be careful in where we draw the line on what is acceptable evidence, um, but at the same time ask the question, how do we actually extend the line of what is acceptable? Is there a middle way? Um, can we see um, that there's anecdotal feedback if it's significant and consistent is that acceptable if perceived impact becomes the experience of actual input impact or if activities are resulting in regular change or an objective achieve um, is that something we can say well that's evidence that may not have had the research but is worthy of certainly more consideration Next slide. So are there other ways of showing that what we do in our prevention efforts actually works? Um, and let's also, I just add, not forget that uh, activities are often not seen as prevention focused, but actually can result in significant prevention outcomes. Uh, and think of the needs to look at issues around employment, education, schooling, housing, healthcare and nutrition, exercise and sporting opportunities, other opportunities for, for time and, and life, uh, and all the issues around human dignity preservation. Do we need research into this broader concept of what works in prevention? And the evidence base for this uh, as something we need to, to consider more significantly. Next slide. So, uh, in summary, um, there are lots of challenges uh, and there are more questions than answers. Um, there is an evidence base for prevention. We know we've got some very good gold card research that shows what works. We have got the standards which Ivana will tell you all about. We have got the universal prevention curriculum, which is a tremendous contribution to how we should go about our prevention work. But I hope we can also consider how we can focus the investment of limited resources into evidence-based activities and the evaluation of what is being done. And should we broaden our understand uh, our acceptance of what evidence means should we be speaking about evidence-based principles or are we talking about evidence-based programs and how do we ensure that we don't prevent new evidence-based activities being developed because all we will ever go for are the ones that have been proved to work rather than therefore the initiative of developing new an effective evidence-based uh, activity. Next slide. Thank you. So onwards and upwards, um, let's 
always remember how we've progressed in identifying an evidence-based and evidence-based approaches to prevention over the past 25 years, certainly in my time in the field. Let's not forget the need for research and evaluation, but at the same time, never forget to remember the realities that people face in their prevention work uh, and to not reject it because the gold card can't be uh, provided. Uh, and let's consider the help aspiration for people to climb the stairs a little bit. And I think this is where I hope ISAP can help people find uh, and use that evidence and share what people are doing and achieving. I think this is the role ISAP can play as that focal point for help and support on what constitutes evidence. So I thank you for listening. It's a very special event. Um, I hope there'll be some evidence that this virtual conference has an impact and helps improve our much needed prevention efforts. And final slide. Um, just to say, uh, as I always do, after all is said and done, there's a lot more said than done. I'm guilty of it. I can say a lot. But how do we translate that into practice? How do we make sure that midfield keeps active? It is the engine of the team. It doesn't get the profile and recognition, but thank you all those in the field for all the work they do. I've seen some tremendous activity and commitment. Uh, and let's keep trying to climb that table. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you for your insight, particularly the fact that we all recognize that for every marathon that is ever run, there are thousands of people who enter knowing that there will always only be one winner. In spite of that, the outcomes which could be unexpected can at the same time and are worth the efforts being made. With that, I bring you now our next speaker, Giovanna Campello who is no stranger to, to most of us. She's more than 20 years of experience in the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime in supporting member states and stakeholders at all levels in improving their drug prevention responses, applying and contributing to scientific evidence. Most notably in this context, she has led the publication of the International Standards of Drug Use Prevention in 2013 and the UNODC WHO second updated edition in 2018. Since 2016, she has been leading the prevention, treatment and rehabilitation section of the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, thus promoting evidence-based gender and human rights sensitive practices on drug prevention, treatment, care and rehabilitation, and promoting access to controlled drugs for medicinal purposes. Ms. Campella has a Bachelor of Science in International Relations from the London School of Economics and Political Science and a Master's of Arts in Gender and Developmental uh, Development from the Institute of Development Studies of the University of Sussex, both in the UK. I give over to you, Giovanna Campella. Thank you, David, and um, um, good afternoon, good morning, everybody, and uh, um, thank you for having me, and please bear with me one second while I try to uh, make this work. Um, so, um, well, uh, as uh, David just mentioned, I want to present to you a bit the standards, the, uh, the standards that we have recently published together with WHO. And, um, and but before I do that, um, let me tell you a little bit about why and how we developed the standards. And uh, um, so what happened was that at a certain point I had been studying and, you know, uh, with the help of Jeff, um, who was working, doing amazing work in the field of education, 
um, pre I had been studying prevention for a long, long time, and uh, I knew that there was a lot of science out there that showed that prevention intervention could be really powerful, uh, especially in the life of um, children and youth. And um, But then in talking, especially with delegates, even of big countries with loads of resources, um, you could really see that um, people did not know or did not believe that this happened. And some of this, uh, um, Jeff just told us about, you know, how uh, many of the decision makers end up doing all sorts of decision and not basing themselves on science at all. And certainly there was the case um, when we started in, in, uh, um, in the field of prevention. So I really decided, well, as a contribution, I will try to make an effort to really summarize what works and what doesn't work in prevention. And that's how um, the first edition of the standards, as David mentioned, in 2013 came about. And then after five years, we um, published an updated edition with um, WHO uh, in 2018. And this is the one that I'm presenting to you today. And in doing so, we had to um, uh, I'm not answer, well, we had to address many of the questions, in fact, all of the questions that uh, uh, Jeff has just raised. And, uh, um, well, it's not that we found the right answer for certain, but we had to decide a, of an answer or a practical answer for ourselves. So what I'm presenting to you is our the point of view of of a collective of you made by the UNODC and WHO and with the help of more than 100 experts from 47 countries, um, and uh, where we try to give an answer of what is evidence-based prevention, what this means, evidence-based, how does it look like, and and it is an answer. We hope it will be of inspiration to you. And of course, uh, with the idea that there are as many answers as any as there are as you know people in this call and more. And uh, to give you an idea um, of what we meant by evidence-based, when what we were doing in the standards was really to look for studies that uh, um, uh, studied whether uh, an intervention had been able to prevent use uh, um, in uh, in children, youth, or adults. Um, in our case, we accepted uh, um, use of any psychoactive substance, and also we also noted if there were um, other good results in terms of other risky behaviors. So, for example, this is the kind of study that we used. This is a study that looks at the effectiveness of an intervention that is delivered to children that are two to five years of age. Yes, you heard that right, two to five, very young children. And of course, you don't talk about the dangers of drugs with these children, and you really just help them develop their skills. And um, this study followed a group of children, which is represented in blue here, until they were 21. And the children in, represented in the blue line is the children that did the program, and the children represented in the red line is the children that did not do the program. And you can see that when they were 21, the children that had done the program when they were two to five had, were using marijuana less, there was lower rate of teenage pregnancy, and there was higher rate of enrollment in college. So this is the kind of studies that we are looking at um, in the standards to really see whether uh, an intervention has made a difference in terms of lower rates of use, lower rates of other risky behaviors, and maybe higher rates of positive and prosocial behavior. So what did we find out? Well, in short, we found out that there are many, 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 and this is, you can see this in this table, many interventions and policies that have been found to be effective in preventing drug use, 
and other risky behaviors. And you have interventions and policies for any of the ages of the development of children and people, and in many different settings. And uh, I will talk a little bit uh, uh, more, uh, more about that. Another thing that we found out is that because evidence-based prevention really looks at the root causes of the problem, and these root causes are at the, uh, at the basis of many different risky behaviors, when you do evidence-based prevention, you're not only preventing drug use, or substance use disorders, but you are also this, they also results in less mental health problems, less violent behavior, less delinquency, less risky sexual behavior, and better school performance, for example. Again, this I'm presenting to you the, uh, um, the results of a specific study as an example. And this is great. And as you can imagine, what we also found is that evidence-based prevention is cost effective. And so for every dollar that you spend in prevention, you save at least 10. And believe me, um, this is a very conservative calculation that I'm giving you. I could quote much higher numbers, but they would be on specific interventions. So I'm giving you a safe but very solid um, estimate of how much you're saving by investing in prevention so that you can quote it when you go and ask for money to your policymakers for evidence-based prevention. And this should come to as no surprise because really what we are talking about here is supporting the healthy and safe development of children and the well-being of youth and adults. Um, so how does this evidence-based prevention look like? Obviously, I don't have the time to go through each one of these interventions one by one although I could, uh, but it would take us a very long time. So what I have organized this, I've organized this up around some few messages, which I will go through one by one. So the first message is that um, evidence-based prevention starts early. In fact, the earlier, the better. And in the standards, you can find examples of interventions that have been found to be effective um, in even in infancy, in early childhood, but even during pregnancy. So prenatal visits um, or services for pregnant women, especially if they suffer from a drug use or a substance use disorder. Then um, early childhood education for children from two to five years of age. And then a lot that can be done for children in um, primary school age to develop their personal and social skills, either through classroom environment or through um, uh, education. And then, of course, the provision of mental health services. So if you remember this graph that I have just shown you, um, this is from a early childhood education uh, program. So as you can see, there is a lot that can be done um, when children are very young that has been shown to prevent substance use and other risky behavior later in life when the children become adolescents or even adults. Um, a second message is to focus on the development of children and youth and not only on information. Now, don't get me wrong, information uh, about the danger of drugs, the perception of the risk of drugs is still very important, but it's not the only factor here. Um, you can, this is a very classic graph from the United States where you can see that has the perceived harm of marijuana in this case goes down among youth, the marijuana use uh, uh, goes up and vice versa. And I know that you will have immediately after me, um, you will have a uh, you will have the opportunity to listen to Professor Crano, and Bill is one of the few around the world, if not the only one, to be honest, that has really looked very carefully into how to develop messages um, that are effective and persuasive. So um, I really invite you to um, make 
big treasure, we say in Italian, um, of, uh, of, uh, um, of, uh, this, uh, of his presentation after mine. But for me, what I, am, I was telling you about is about the importance of supporting the development of children. And one of the interventions that we use a lot for this and that I would like to talk to you about a little bit more is parenting skills or family skills programs. And these are really programs where you help parents to be better parents in very simple ways, no lectures, no psychological jargon, um, just very simple activities that can be delivered by a, a, a fellow parent even. Um, and activities that really increase the bond between parents and children, which is one of the most important protective factors in the life of children, but also give um, parents a how can I put it, very simple um, ways and effective ways to monitor uh, and, uh, the lives and of their children, be involved in a positive way, set limits in a positive um, and developmentally appropriate way. And I want to give you an example of an activity from one of our programs. In this activity, parents and children learn about recognizing when they are stressed cope with their own stress and recognizing the stress in the other. And the activities first, the parents and children do it separately, and then they get together. And in the activity together, uh, parents or children are asked to guess uh, how stressed the other would be in different circumstances. And who do you think is better at guessing, the parents or the children? Unfortunately, we cannot have a dialogue here, so I need to give you the answer straight. And I don't know about you, but I always thought that the parents would be better at guessing, but no, it's the children. And it's a very emotional and very powerful moment when parents realize how um, little they are able to recognize the stress in their children and in themselves, how much better their children are at doing that, and how disruptive this can be and what they can do about it. Um, so these are the kind of programs that we do, and we have found that these programs are not only effective in preventing drug use and substance use, but they are effective not only with the nice middle class uh, uh, communities, but they are very effective also in violent communities. They are effective in poor communities. They are um, effective with in displaced populations and refugees. This is the example of a pro UNODC program that we delivered amongst refugees. They are the kind of prevention that is most consistently beneficial for both girls and boys. And this again is um, a study uh, uh, amongst refugees for uh, showing effectiveness for both girls and boys. And they have been found to be effective by WHO uh, in preventing youth violence and child maltreatment. So they are so important, we think, that uh, we have developed our own programs that are tailored to the needs of low and middle income countries and they are in the public domain at the disposal of everybody to use. And uh, um, we have been very fortunate to already start using them in Africa, in Cote d'Ivoire, in Nigeria, and in Zanzibar, Tanzania. There are experiences, not with, the, with UNODC, but there are excellent experiences in South Africa. So it is something that has been used successfully also in this continent. And uh, um, in the context of COVID, I think you will agree with me that parents and families have been put sometimes under really, really strong stress. And that is why we have adapted the programs that we have and developed resources for parents on how to cope with stress in a way that is positive for the family to the extent possible. And they are already translated in many languages and they are available to everybody. And here, in fact, you can see Ala on the screen, she is one of our developers and trainers, and she is giving a booster section session remotely 
to our trainers in the Côte d'Ivoire um, to uh, use the resources uh, for, um, for parents during COVID-19. Um, so just to, there are other kinds of programs that develop the personal and social skills um, of children and youth, but this is, in our opinion, one of the most powerful examples. And at the same time, of course, while evidence-based prevention can start very early, it's never too late. And there are many interventions that have been found to be effective for adolescents and for adults. And here I cannot I go through them in, um, in practice. And I've just noted in, in detail and I've just noticed that I've done something very, very wrong with the pictures because they're all the same. But um, just to let you know that, uh, for example, some of the most important kind of interventions in adolescence and adulthood is preventive education in schools and outside school, school policies and attachment, alcohol and tobacco policies. And I know that you have some excellent interventions after bills uh, um, on the experiences worldwide and in the African continent in particular. Uh, on this, uh, screening a brief intervention, workplace prevention, and uh, prevention in entertainment venues. And you can find more information about what to do in the standards. Another message is uh, um, that we have is to use evidence-based programs as far as it is possible. And of course, this is where some of, uh, um, we would have a very big discussion with, uh, with Jeff. Um, but in general, we've, uh, we have thought about using evidence-based programs along this line. Is it easier to make a suit or buy a ready-made suit? And I'm, I've chosen an example, like not like a loose dress, but a suit for a reason, because to develop an, a, a program that works in prevention is not easy. And uh, um, we always recommend, if at all possible, to use a program that has been found to be effective already elsewhere. And you can always try it first and then make changes, right? And um, we have been doing this uh, with regard, for example, to prevention education, all over the world, including in Cote d'Ivoire. And um, of course, you don't just take a program like in this case, Lion's Quest and parachute it in the country. You need to translate it and to culturally adapt it in a very respectful way. But we have found that this can um, bring two very good results. So for example, this is uh, an adaptation in Southeastern Europe, in Montenegro, and you can really see that um, we managed to prevent the lifetime use of marijuana, um, the uh, in use of marijuana in the last 30 days, and the intention to use marijuana in the next three months among kids that were 12 to 14 years of age. And in the continent, we know that uh, um, uh, we have worked with the government of Nigeria to adapt and disseminate another evidence-based program called Unplugged. And um, so there are examples, but of course there will be times, as Jeff was already mentioning, where you cannot access an evidence-based program. And this is where um, you can look in the standard and see what works and what does not work. Because for each of the interventions that are, that are listed in the standards, we give you an idea of what works and what does not work. Like for example, in terms of preventive education, what works is to focus on skills, use interactive methods um, and a structured uh, weekly sessions, a certain numbers of them delivered by very well-trained facilitators. We know that um, you don't, will not get much result if you use only lecturing, if you only give information, if you do single session or only focus on self-esteem or uh, moral decisions. 
and um, you can compare what is in the standards in terms of guidance with your existing programs and at least try to move towards uh, um, something that has been found to be effective elsewhere. And you can do this with, uh, we can use the standard to do this with any of the strategies that are listed in the standards. And then I was doing a similar kind of presentation earlier during the week and Jeff reminded me that of course you as you have ISAP as a resource, a place where there are many practitioners from all over the world that have tried to um, give life to evidence-based prevention and really change the life of children and youth. And maybe they have already faced similar problems to yours and you can join hands and put your heads together to uh, solve these problems. So, and finally, of course, not only try to use evidence-based program as much as possible and use the standards to do that, but also try and work in as many settings as possible. And I want to give you an example of a study that followed children between the age of 12 to about the age of 18. And of course, as you can expect in this age, and you can see that in the gray line, the prevalence of, um, in this case, is the non-medical use of prescription opioids, a very uh, um, uh, topical um, uh, argue, uh, topic. <laughs> um, so the prevalence goes up. But, and if you do some good uh, school-based prevention, the prevalence still goes up, but much less. But if you add family-based prevention, uh, um, it goes up even less. And as you, as I, I mentioned before, there are many settings in which you can and you should be working: the family, the school, community, the workplace, and the health sector. So um, I hope I've given you at least some ideas um, as to how to use the standards to improve uh, your prevention and how to use ISAP to exchange these experiences. And I hope I have inspired you at least a little bit to use these two amazing resources and the many more resources that there are all around the world. Um, because uh, ultimately we are all moved by uh, the same goal, which is to support the healthy and safe development of children and youth. And I really do believe that with evidence-based prevention, we can make an enormous difference. And with this, I thank you. Thank you very much, Joanna. And you certainly have inspired us. Also, what has come out very, very clearly is, and the evidence speaks for itself, that the messages that even prenatal programs are of importance and that it is never too early or too late to start with any of these types of programs. And I particularly like the fact that you emphasize to some extent the need for the moral regeneration within the family as being a key element that needs to be addressed. So thank you very much for your insight. I would now like to introduce our next speaker, Professor Carno, Crano, sorry. Professor Crano is the OSCAM Professor of Psychology at Claremont Graduate University, where he has taught for the last 22 years. Previously, he was a professor in the chair in the Department of Communication at the University of Arizona, Michigan State University, and Texas A&M University. He has also served as a liaison scientist for the US Office of Naval Research in London, as NATO senior scientist at the University of Southampton, UK, and as a Fulbright senior, Fulbright senior scholar at the Universidad Rio Grande do Sol. His basic research has been focused on evaluation of social interventions, the development of models of attitudes of development and attitude change with reference to drug prevention during adolescence. His theories are supported by NIDA and recently he has helped create a set of universal standards for drug prevention for the UN Office of Drugs and Crime, the US Department of State 
and the Organization of American States, SICAD. He is the course developer for the Universal Prevention Curriculum Media Track and developed a course on awareness prevention and outreach for rural communities for the Colombo Plan. He has also published extensively. So who better to enlighten us on media-based prevention programs? We are all listening. Over to you, Professor Crano. Thank you. Um, thank you, David. I'm not quite sure. Uh, okay, show my screen. I'm not quite sure that I'm on yet. Oh, there I am. And uh, I, I want to thank you for this kind introduction. I want also to thank my uh, prior speakers. Uh, Jeff, especially for a slide putting, uh, showing Liverpool at the top of the stairs, <laughs> did my heart good. And also to Giovanna uh, for the, her major work that she has done on the prevention standards. This was a this is a monumental effort, and one that I think really is uh, should be uh, uh, paid attention to by everyone who is working in the field. Um, as uh, Jeff has, uh, or I'm sorry, as David has uh, said, uh, my work has to do really with, with, uh, with uh, what I call uh, persuasive prevention, and I, I think it's important because very often what we've done in the field of uh, prevention uh, isn't very persuasive, and we haven't, and, and we haven't really succeeded very well. If you look at some of the data that we've uh, collected in our country, this is data going from 2000 to 2015. I could go farther, uh, but the data pretty much look the same. We've spent enormous amounts of money in the country uh, uh, attempting to uh, uh, interdict supply and also to uh, effect demand reduction. And as you can see from the past 15 years, this is looking at data that we've collected, uh, that has been collected in our country uh, in a, a wonderful piece of, uh, of work by Monitoring the Future uh, researchers, where they follow basically a random sample of, of kids in 8th, 10th, and 12th grades. If you add six to each of those numbers, you get about the appropriate approximate age of these kids. Uh, and you see that what has happened, despite we've, uh, the money that we've spent, including the money on media-based prevention, which is what I like to talk, want to talk about today, is that the, the uh, research really hasn't shown us very much uh, improvement. These are flat lines, basically, despite billions of dollars spent on our, our, our prevention programs. And uh, the question then becomes, well, what, what, what's going on? Uh, if we look at mass media, for example, use in that, and it's not t terribly... Uh, frequent because mass media can be very expensive, um, it, it, the, the results haven't been particularly successful. I mean, at times you see pretty much uh, pretty good uh, evidence of uh, prevention of psychotropic substances, but uh, very often what you find are failures, and when the failures happen, they are usually spectacular because they cost so much money. Um, on the other hand, if they do work, Successful campaigns are very good value. You reach tremendous numbers of people uh, at, at uh, pennies per exposure. You can reach even uh, people even in remote places. As I said, failed campaigns are intolerably expensive, but uh, why? why, why, why don't they work so well? And I think probably the reason that at least that I've come to is that the campaigns have typically ignored evidence on persuasive persuasion, which results in the use of unpersuasive per prevention communications. If I want to persuade you not to use uh, uh, substances, I've got to persuade you not to do it. And if my 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 uh, uh, media aren't persuasive, then we're kind of stuck. Then it's not going to work for us. Prevention almost always involves persuasion. And if you look at some of the ads that are out there on our, in our attempts at persuading people to do what we think they should do, what you find is that, wow, well, that ad isn't very persuasive. Why in the world would a kid or an adolescent who, we, who is on the verge of starting something that he shouldn't be starting, 
why in the world would we be would, would that kid be be interested in in listening to what we have to say? Let me consult, let me show you an ad that uh, was uh, had great currency a while ago uh, in an earlier a media campaign in the United States. Um, in uh, uh, then I want you then I'm going to ask you a couple of questions about or ask a couple of questions about whether it's any good. This is the ad. I hope. Oops. Oops. Let me try it again. Okay, last time. This is drugs. This is your brain on drugs. Any questions? This ad is well recognized by almost any anyone in my generation, years later, and even following. And here's the resp responses if you go onto that ad and then look at uh, what is what what the ad uh, uh, evoked. Here's the kind of re responses you get from young smart people uh, who watched it. Yeah, can I get a side of bacon with those eggs? Or can you make that over easy? Or yes, you're going to. Eat, are, are you going to eat my brain? Because I'm really hungry, mostly from doing drugs. Or no, that's a frying pan and that's an egg. I think whoever wrote this ad is on drugs. These responses to the ad trivialize the problem. Uh, using uh, uh, drugs in, uh, in youth is really not a good thing, and we all know that. And the question is, how do we do it in such a way, how do we persuade the kids in such a way that they don't start? Because starting is, uh, uh, it, once you've started, it's much more difficult for me to get you to quit. But if I can keep you from starting, uh, it makes my life much easier. Uh, have we learned anything from this this campaign, which did not work, by the way? Everyone remembers the ad, but it didn't persuade anybody about anything. For example, how about a, a campaign that the, the state of South Dakota in my country recently inaugurated? It costs only about a half a million dollars to do this, and South Dakota is not that rich a state, and so this is a good bite out of their budget. Here's the ad, essentially. Oh, uh, the, 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 the crawler on the ad, meth, we're on it. Now that's a kind of an interesting campaign slogan, isn't it? Uh, you really don't wanna, uh, wanna uh, encourage people to use methamphetamines. So these are dangerous drugs and they really can hurt you. However, uh, the, the campaign organizers say, would say, well, obviously we're not arguing for meth, it's, it's to get people's attention and, and uh, you know, make them think about not doing it. And uh, the problem is, is that what you've got in response to that is a tremendous number of responses that are funny as can be. Uh, the problem is, is that they have uh, trivialized the issue. This campaign was brought to you by the same people, by the same marketing firm who produced this ad, Don't Jerk and Drive. Now in South Dakota, you've got a lot of snow and icy roads and so forth. So jerking the wheel is a very dangerous thing. But th this ad also, uh, you know, it's cute, but it didn't work. Okay, you you got a lot of uh, talk about it, but that's that's ridiculous. So what should we do instead? Oh, sorry about that. This is a note I wrote to myself. Uh, here are some steps that you need to think about in in uh, when you're trying to use the media to to uh, uh, persuade people not to do something, right? And and it, when you're trying to ask people not to do something, it always involves persuasion. Why should I listen to you? You're telling me not to do something I think I might enjoy a lot or I, my, my friends all like, what, why, should I, why, why should I do it? One of the things you have not to do is to trivialize the issue. It doesn't help you to make a joke out of what you're telling people. Induce the audience to pay attention to your message from start to finish. This is the first uh, uh, aspect of almost any media campaign. If you're not watching it or listening to it, it's not going to work. So you need to get the audience to pay attention to it. Did people pay attention to the, this is your brain on drugs ad? Yeah, I, he still do, despite it's been, I don't know how many years that it's been on online. Uh, I, I've looked at that ad every time I do, I kind of, I, I sort of like what I see, it's fun, it's it, this, but it doesn't work, it doesn't make me think, well, I, I better not ever use drugs again. Uh, require them, compel them by the force of the message to, to think about what you just told them. Present information in a way that's difficult to counter argue, that's difficult for a person to say, oh, that's nonsense. Get buy-in if possible, that is a commitment to act, 
And remember that a single presentation doesn't do very much for you. Rinse and repeat. Boost the effect of the initial effect of your uh, of your work of your uh, inoculation. Let us say with booster shots. That is, keep doing it. Don't don't think that one ad is going to solve all of your problems. It won't. The media don't work that way. Uh, but they do work if you do it right. Uh, so do this and not that. This is ridiculous. Um, so our solution. Uh, since I don't have very much time, is to jump immediately to, and I can't talk about all of the evidence that we've got here. You might want to check out the training manual of the media-based prevention interventions that uh, uh, the uh, uh, that is out there and is available, I think, on, uh, on on this website. And you might be able to learn some things that really are useful. And one of the things you might learn about is the use of a new model that we've come up with, which try to inter which tries to integrate critical insights from media and persuasion research, uh, which I think will uh, result in, in effective presentation, uh, prevention. What we come up with uh, uh, at the end of many of our talks on prevention is we don't really have, there's so much stuff there. There's a, we've got 60, 70 years of really strong, well-established evidence on persuasion. And my contention that per prevention almost inevitably involves persuasion uh, it I re requires you to understand what that evidence says, what it tells you, what the advice is that you should use when creating a prevention, a, a, a preventive message. Well, you can't, you know, I've been studying this stuff for 50 years, I think, or 100 years, it seems. So I, I don't expect somebody, a new minister, put into a position of running the media campaigns, uh, the drug anti drug campaigns in his or her country uh, to, to try and absorb all that. They've got other, other fish to fry. So what do we do? Well, uh, I've tried to uh, distill the advice into a rather simple acronym called EQUIP uh, it, that I think uh, will help you organize how you construct a message that actually persuades people. And really what the, what the EQUIP is all about is a very, very, very brief introduction to how to do that. Um, I, I don't expect that you could become a, the world's foremost authority on this stuff after a, a two-minute presentation, but here's what you ought to be thinking about if you're, let's say, farming out your prevention campaign to, to a, uh, a, a, a media shop, uh, to a public relations firm, to groups that uh, supposedly are uh, good at this sort of thing, but um, sometimes aren't. So the first thing you need to do is engage. You have to attract and maintain attention of your audience throughout your presentation. The, and what that presentation ought to do first is raise a question in the mind of the receivers about a pro-drug attitude. The, uh, we're talking now, I, I'm really focused on, typically on adolescents because I care about them and I realize that most of them don't know any very much about the uh, uh, dangerous effects of drugs. They know that their best friends are doing it, that their girlfriend or boyfriend might be pushing them to do so, uh, but they don't know, well, what, what are the, what's really at stake here? What, what can this do? It, Giovanna showed you a little bit about what, what, the, uh, what prevention can do for you and what uh, lack of prevention can do to you. Uh, and, but if you talk to most adolescents about uh, almost any drug, what you find is a, a dearth of real of, of evidence-based information or of really understanding. So you ask a simple question. I'm not asking you to change anything. It's just you raise the question. Are you, for example, we do this in, in some of our work with young uh, adolescents. Uh, on the verge of starting something, like say uh, marijuana or cannabis, the question might be: Are, are you sure this drug is is, is safe? I, that's just a question. I'm not arguing with you at all, and so forth. You write to the answer, and then you undermine that answer. You destabilize that attitude. You destabilize it by saying, "Gee, uh, you know, we, we, there's plenty of research out there from some of our best uh, medical schools in the country." Uh, Hopkins and Harvard and all these uh, wonderful places uh, that uh, that don't that, that that don't agree with you. And here's some information. Now we're at the informed stage. Here's some information that might, in fact, really uh, uh, inform you about something that might really make a big difference for you. And then you have to persuade, which is in our terminology, which is to provide incentives for agreement. Why should I agree with your message and not? go on with what my buddy just told me. 
Well, here's some things that might help you with. I won't go into those techniques that we've talked about, but they're there, they're available for you to read about or to think about or to write me and I'll tell you about them uh, if you want. And so uh, these, are the, these are the things that you need to think about when you're per, uh, creating a persuasive message, a message. But remember, if you're writing, a, doing a campaign, a media-based campaign, you need lots of messages. And they can't be all saying exactly the same thing. You want to get, keep your audience. You want to get people to understand or to watch what you're doing and so forth. We run a program uh, based on uh, uh, support by the State Department every year where we bring people in uh, from all over the world and train them in this in this process. It is a long and and not difficult, you know, it's difficult, uh, but it works. And it's playing, paying uh, good, good, good. Uh, rewards in various countries throughout the world now who are taking uh, this this program to heart. Um, so let's use the quip and, ever, and and look at the effectiveness of the of the this is your brain on drugs ad. Did it attract people's attention? Yes, initially, even now for people like me who read ads a lot and watch them all the time, uh, it, it still maintains my attention. Did it raise a question in your minds? No, it didn't. Uh, did it uh, undermine? Did it threaten an exist, existing belief and provide an alternative? No. Did it inform you? Did it tell you how to avoid frying your brain? No. Uh, did it was it persuasive? No. It's telling me to avoid a drug, but not how to do it or why I should, and it will fail, and it did fail. But still, uh, a lot of the people from the Partnership for Drug-Free America, which is now defunct, always point out, well, Americans all remember that this is your brain on drugs ad. Yeah, that's right. But what, here's, here's something that, uh, that needs to be said, which is there's a very different, very big difference between memorability of an ad and its persuasibility. These are different things. I can remember something and still not be persuaded by it. So here's the working assumptions that we go into the field with. People don't always believe what they're told, especially when dealing with psychotropic substances. There's a lot of pressure on kids to use them. We need to overcome resistance to attain positive preventive effects. And the first and foremost major consideration when we enter the field is this. We expect counter arguments. We expect people to say, oh, no, no, no. And the equip can help you overcome these defensive reactions uh, because they are destructive. So building on the equip, what should you do? Well, build ads that make resistance difficult, impossible, or apparently unnecessary. This is part of the persuasion part, the a P part of the equip model. Target or tailor the persuasive message to the susceptibilities of the audience. What do they care about? You better find out who your audience is before you go out to the field and try and persuade them. Because if you don't know that, you're gonna fail. When dealing with young adult audiences, use message sources they respect. Don't let them take the easy way out. Oh, he doesn't know what I'm talking about. He doesn't live my life and so forth and so on. Uh, figure out who your sources should be that would, that would really appeal to who you're talking to. If you don't do this preliminary work, you're wasting your time and wasting a lot of money. Uh, more specific, do's and don'ts. Don't overpromise. Don't overthreaten. Okay? People don't listen to it. They don't believe you. Fear arousing ads usually fail. If I try to scare you out of using drugs, that usually doesn't work. So avoid them. Unbelievable ads, ads that, that promise you the stars or threaten you with dire consequences, usually fail. Avoid them. Why do it? Exaggerated ads usually fail. Avoid them. Whimsical ads usually fail. I, I, I keep remembering an ad that uh, was put out in one of our campaigns uh, a while back where it had a, a, a car. This was an ad, a, a, a major program, cost us $1.4 billion. It failed too. Uh, meant to uh, uh, stop young adolescents who are on the verge of starting something. In this case, marijuana was the foremost target, and along with uh, inhalant uh, drugs, uh, substances. Uh, and, and here's a dancing bear, a cartoon dancing bear, dancing around with somebody, I forget, forgot who, another character. And uh, as they do a little circle with each other, they uh, uh, are stepping on a marijuana joint. It's like, this is, you're trying to persuade a 16 year old kid not to start using marijuana with a dancing bear? Give me a break. I mean, this is a waste of money. And those ads were, were played and paid for on primetime TV. I, come on, give me a break. This is crazy. Disgusting ads usually fail. How much? How often do you walk down the street, see something really disgusting, and say, boy, I really want to see that again? You don't do it. The same thing with an ad. If I'm trying to disgust you, uh, I can I can succeed. I, I can 
create as many disgusting ads as you really want, but it won't work because what you have to do, what you then do is make people not watch your ad because it's disgusting. We don't like to be disgusting. So don't do that. It's crazy. Here's something that we don't know and we haven't figured out yet, but is now coming on board really strongly. If your prevent, pre, uh, preventive uh, uh, approach fails, this will result in future failures because it reinforces people's certainty that they're right and you're wrong. And so what, what, a, what a current failure does is increase resistance to the next person in the field who's trying to persuade people to act properly. Okay, you, you, every time a, pers a failed persuasive ad is shown that I see like uh, meth were on it, I think to myself, ah, this is making my life much more difficult than it needs to be. And I don't like that very much. And not just because it's five o'clock in the morning here. For young adults op uh, involve opinion leaders as message sources, but choose carefully. I I'm kind of a soccer nut. And so um, I keep thinking back uh, uh, to uh, the great Maradona. And imagine him at the very early stages of his career. He was a national hero. Imagine using him as a as a spokesperson for not using cocaine. And then, as it turns out, over the years, he became uh, unfortunately uh, uh, not really dependent on that on that drug. People who listen to him at the start will feel disillusioned, and that disillusionment can cause some real problems. So, tr but and and finally, aim to try to create a, a norm of act of abstinence in your in your uh uh in in the group that you're trying to persuade because the norm actually will help help you will help uh it will facilitate your prevention efforts here's some pictures that people have used in a thing called the anti-meth campaign or uh, the montana meth campaign look at some of this stuff you'll never worry about lipstick on your teeth again do you really want to watch that more see that ad more than once or you see people just picking scabs off their arms and so forth, or you see a little kid with a, uh, just, uh, trying to bring back life. It, these are disgusting. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not talking, I'm not denying the well intentions, uh, intentions, uh, uh, the good intentions of people who put these ads out, but I'm telling you, uh, this stuff you might think is going to work, but it doesn't because people don't watch it. They don't want to deal with it. And this ad, this approach also failed. So I, I have uh, uh, exhausted my time, unfortunately, uh, or more, more than that, I guess, uh, by a minute or so. So I want to thank you for your kind attention to uh, my talk. And in the words of the uh, Brain on Drugs ad, any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Crano, for that very enlightening. And I think one of the messages that I've got from this is that in order for us to be able to be effective, we need to be equipped. And you have given us that equip in order to be able to do exactly that. That brings us then to the next part of the mess of the program. And I'd just like to say that during lockdown, South Africa introduced a total ban on alcohol sales in an attempt to prevent the harm and to protect the public from using drugs. At the same time, we do not believe that it was very effective. And when the restrictions were lifted, we immediately learned that what we had achieved was actually very little, if anything at all. We should have invited our distinguished panelists to give us their insights before the ban was imposed. But we may be in for a second wave, and so I look forward to hearing your take on alcohol use prevention and matters related thereto, the environmental and prevention initiatives. Our first panelist that I'd like to introduce is Dr. Montero, who is the advisor on alcohol at the Pan American Health Organization in Washington, D.C. for 17 years after a 10-year coordinating the program on substance abuse at the World Health Organization in Geneva. Dr. Montero is a medical doctor with a PhD in psychopharmacology from the Federal University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, being responsible for the technical cooperation activities related to alcohol policy, research and capacity building 
in the region of the Americas. She has authored many scientific publications, and I hand over to you, Dr. Montero, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, let me show my presentation. Okay, so can you all see that? Please confirm. Yes, we can, Maricela. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, thank you very much for this invitation. I will give you a very brief uh, summary of uh, what's going on in the region of the Americas and about public policies aimed at uh, preventing and reducing alcohol consumption and related harms. As uh, probably many of you know already, alcohol contributes to many diseases, actually over 200 different ICD-10 diagnoses, uh, and uh, the harm that alcohol causes is not only to the drinker, but also to others that may not even drink. So alcohol, of course, contributes 100% to alcohol use disorders. If alcohol is not consume, consumed, there wouldn't be any alcohol dependence or harmful use. Uh, but also uh, less than 100% in many other categories, like uh, almost 20% of all suicides, of personal interpersonal violence, including domestic violence, traffic injuries, epilepsy, liver cirrhosis, several types of cancers, and also uh, communicable diseases, infections. It facilitates infections because alcohol is an immunosuppressant and it's linked to uh, the uh, acquiring the uh, TB, uh, HIV, and now we know also can facilitate uh, COVID-19 because it does affect uh, the immunity there and facilitate uh, pneumonia and this type of respiratory, acute respiratory problems, and uh, uh, heart disease, diabetes as well. So how do we measure uh, alcohol consumption in a population? There are uh, several indicators, but three of the most utilized ones globally are alcohol per capita consumption, which is the total amount of in volume of alcohol that was sold and consumed in a country uh, per capita and not the whole population. The WHO uses those over 15 years of age because in population to compare countries, you need uh, to consider that uh, countries with very large amounts of young people, they may underestimate uh, the consumption and make the comparisons very different, uh, very difficult. So uh, we standardize uh, the population using the UN population and only those with 15 years of age or older, even though we recognize that people start drinking before 15 but that contribution is very small to the total amount of alcohol consumed in a country. And that is per year in liters of pure alcohol. So you transform the liters of beer, wine, whiskey, or whatever is produced into just the portion that is in pure alcohol and add all that up and divide by the population. This is the simple, the simplest and most feasible, uh, feasible indicator that uh, we have. And all countries can calculate that indicator, even though many do not. We'll get there eventually. Uh, but when you, when you use per capita consumption, you don't know who does the drinking and uh, how much uh, a person or a group of people drinks is only a division of the total alcohol by the population of uh, a country. 
So you have two other indicators and uh, derived from there, you need more indicators like the prevalence of people that never drink alcohol, <clears throat> they're abstainers, or people who stop drinking. And uh, another very common indicator is the heavy episodic drinking in many countries called binge drinking, which is defined as drinking uh, about five drinks of alcohol in an occasion, at least once a month. And we can do that standardized, but for that you need surveys, population surveys to be able to calculate and ask in a standardized way those questions. And you also have the prevalence in the population of alcohol use disorders, either alcohol uh, dependence or harmful use of alcohol, according to ICD-10. So here is not just uh, the drink, the uh, drinking there is of uh, at a high risk level, but also causing other harms. And then in 2015, uh, as you may also know, a new agenda for development called the Sustainable Development Goals agenda set uh, uh, new targets and indicators in all areas uh, of uh, development related to development. One of them is, uh, is health, is the area number three. In health, there are several indicators and 3.5 is the indicator related to uh, strengthening prevention and uh, uh, treatment of substance abuse. And as you can see, uh, sorry here, uh, there are two, uh, two indicators for that target. One is related to the coverage of treatment and the other is harmful use of alcohol specifically separate and the indicator is the per capita alcohol consumption of a population in a calendar year. That means that every country has agreed to report to the UN on a yearly basis uh, that uh, number, that indicator. And also indicates that per capita consumption is a good indication of uh, indicator of the harmful use of alcohol. It has been accepted and adopted by the UN and it is has been for many years by WHO. And that also implies, oops, uh, okay, uh, that uh, the per capita consumption of a population does relate to the total mortality and also specific alcohol mortality in that same country. It's very important to know that. So when you are decreasing the total consumption, you are decreasing also harms related to alcohol. As you can see here, the trends worldwide are not very good. They vary from region to region. In the European region, is it has been uh, decreasing and uh, this has been related to policies implemented in several countries in the region of the Americas basically has been stable, not only since the year 2000, but since 1990. Very small change in total per capita consumption at a level that is high. It is this, the region with the second highest per capita consumption in the world and uh, well above the global average. And, and there are, you can see in blue, uh, the African region, it's the same pattern and all the regions are actually increasing. So here is uh, the changes since 1990 per capita consumption country by country. So you can see that the uh, changes have been uh, relatively small and they have been <clears throat> Uh, on average for the whole region, they decreased since 1990 from 8.5 liters total to 7.9 liters. Uh, so that's a very small reduction. And when you look uh, from the year 2000 uh, in the, the same changes in recorded and unrecorded, almost half of the countries uh, basically have increased, half have decreased, and the overall effect <clears throat> have been even smaller than for the total period uh, since 1990. 
So things are not uh, moving, not getting better in, in terms of alcohol per capita consumption. That means that the burden of alcohol, the impact on the harms, on mortality, on disability, is probably not changing as well. In terms, uh, I'll show you that uh, in a bit. And you can also look at the heavy, per, uh, heavy episodic drinking. And here you can see that the same pattern uh, is seen. There is a correlation between total consumption and heavy episodic drinking. And the, you can see that the countries that have decreased, they, they're basically being canceled out by the countries that uh, have increased. And on average, what we have currently is about 25% of the total population uh, drinking as heavy episodic drinking, which is per se a very high risk for several of the outcomes. And this 25% is not of the population who drinks, but of the general population. And when you uh, recalculate heavy episodic drinking only among those who drink any alcohol, uh, that uh, goes up to 40% on average. For alcohol use disorders, we are also not in a very good place. We are the region, the second region with the highest prevalence uh, of alcohol dependence and harmful use. You can see that the European region again is the highest. For males is much higher than, for the, in, than in the Americas, the total 14.6% uh, percent counting both diagnoses and in the Americas for males is 11.5%. But if you look now at the women and females, we are the region with the highest prevalence in the world, higher than in Europe, higher than any other region. And this is very uh, worrisome because we are talking about a parent, pattern of use that is related to chronic long-term use of alcohol. So if we are uh, currently uh, with this type of prevalence, and that means that for several years, uh, women have been drinking at levels that put them at risk and lead them to these statistics. So in terms of mortality, deaths caused by alcohol, as you can see here in the Americas in the year 2016, that's the latest statistics of the WHO, we had about 379,000 deaths in the region of the Americas, representing 5.4% of all the deaths. And what are the causes? Very important, the role of injuries from all causes, more than even for NCDs that represent 3.6% of all deaths. And in terms of DALIS, disability adjusted uh, uh, life years that account bring together both early mortality and people living with some disability uh, due to alcohol, a problem that they had in their lives, you have uh, almost 90 million lives lost in uh, or live with less uh, than uh, good health and representing 6.7 percent of all the deaths for all causes in the Americas. That's a very high burden. So now moving to what is uh, that we can do for alcohol prevention. And here I'm taking a public health perspective. It's not how I can improve a group of people only, but thinking at the total population. And uh, it's useful to think, I give a very schematic uh, view of how you can intervene in a chain of events that are very logical and obvious, to, to my opinion. Of course, to consume alcohol, that alcohol needs to be available. In countries that make alcohol illegal for religious purposes, for example, Muslim countries, you will have way less consumption, way less harms. Not that they don't exist, they do, but 
is to a very small, smaller proportion than in any country that, where alcohol is a legal substance. So availability is important. And then from in countries where it's available, then a proportion of the people will try. And of those who try, they will keep consuming alcohol and eventually may have one or more episodes of excessive drinking. Uh, that binge can be eventual, it can be once a month or once in, in a year, it depends on the age, uh, the, the sex, many other uh, factors. And uh, that excessive drinking can have a consequence or not. It may uh, be just acute or if you regularly have episodes of excessive drinking or if you have uh, chronic drinking uh, over time, you have other types of chronic problems uh, that will appear over the years. And you can also have in any of these acute uh, uh, sessions, occasions of drinking, uh, an injury, for example, and you can die, you can have a, a dependence, you can have other chronic problems. And in every part of this chain, you can intervene with prevention. And this is a, a very schematic way of showing from all the, the various types of uh, programs we have, you have those that can affect the availability of alcoholic beverages like the physical availability, where you buy and how much it costs and the marketing and the promotion of alcohol is part of the social norms and social acceptance of alcohol and that relates to it's considered the social availability. You can have programs of education that can include mass media campaigns that you can convince people, persuade people to drink or to not drink too much or not to drink, not to start drinking or children not to avoid drinking. You can have uh, programs in bars, in, uh, for example, to make it safer and not sell to, to people who are uh, intoxicated already and have other policies to train staff and you can also in health services have early interventions you can routinely screen people for how much they drink and for those who are above a certain uh, level that put a risk to their health in the future or already having an effect you can provide brief interventions or motivate them to reduce their drinking and you can also have treatment, rehabilitation for those already with a chronic problem. And you can also finally separate the consumption from the harm, so the typical harm reduction measures. And one that is uh, very cost effective is drink driving countermeasures. You're not attempting to change the consumption, but you are attempting to change the combination of consuming alcohol and driving. So from all the, the ways that you can reduce alcohol problems and consumption, WHO has assessed uh, them for their cost effectiveness. And the most cost effective measures, especially in low and middle income countries, are re all related to the availability of alcohol. Let's go back here in this first more distal part of the chain and is by doing a, a restriction on the access to alcohol, the hours, days, density of outlets, uh, or uh, having laws for selling to minors, and uh, or not selling to them. Uh, you can uh, restrict the advertising, the promotions, the sponsorships, and or ban completely alcohol marketing, and raising taxes uh, on alcohol. And here is not just uh, just any raise or any tax. You need to make alcohol less affordable compared to other products. And for that you need specific taxes and they need to be adjusted for inflation because otherwise they are not health taxes. They are just taxes to increase revenues. Alcohol is a commodity that is bought by many people. So any tax that you increase, uh, it can be a VAT, ad valorem tax, 
uh, or it can be through excise taxes, you can generate a lot more revenues because many people buy whatever they buy, they will uh, buy more. But to have as a health tax, you have uh, a combination of keeping revenues, not so the government will not lose, but also reduce consumption because alcohol is considered inelastic uh, product and people will continue to drink and therefore, uh, but less or some people will drink less and that compensate in, uh, in terms of less problems, less consumption, better uh, health and, let, and, and still have revenues for the government. So it's a win-win situation. With that, uh, it I went down. Yeah, they are. Okay. Okay. Uh, I do understand that, but I'm uh, coming to an end. Uh, WHO have uh, has a, a global aqua strategy since the year 2010. It hasn't been uh, much implemented in many countries, but some progress has uh, been documented in several countries, including countries with very high levels of consumption, like in Russia. And uh, more recently, in the last two years, uh, they released a technical package called, uh, with the acronym SAFER, that brings together the most cost-effective uh, policies that countries can use to implement and reduce alcohol harm. And they are the three best buys are there. That's the three uh, policies I mentioned on uh, physical availability, economic availability, and, and marketing control, plus uh, brief interventions in, in health services and drink driving policies. Uh, with that package being implemented uh, in one country in Africa that uh, has the potential to very soon start that process is Uganda. Uh, uh, countries can make a difference in the short term. It doesn't take several years, especially if they implement taxation, uh, they can have already uh, in one year good results. The regional situation is not very good. As you can see here, the majority of countries are not implementing these uh, five areas of action and uh, very few uh, that have even a national plan or policy, only nine of the 35 countries we have. And the situation is not much better globally. This paper is just an indication that we are not on track for meeting the SDG goal uh, on alcohol and, or drugs uh, and for the uh, NCD global monitoring framework and that set a target of a reduction of a relative 10 percent in per capita consumption this also uh, is not on track to be met by 2025 or the SDG by 2030 so action is needed as soon as possible uh, to change this scenario so I finalized to say that we have several uh, free uh, virtual courses in our virtual campus. They are all online, and I uh, sorry, they are all for self-learning and available. You just need to register and uh, do any of them. And the, and the languages are in parentheses in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Montero. Interest of time, I'm going to go straight into an introduction of Professor Neo Morigella, who is a professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Johannesburg. She's also a consultant for the Alcohol, Tobacco and Other Drug Research Unit, the South African Medical Research Council, and an honorary professor at both the University of Witwatersrand as well as in Cape Town. Professor Morigella has experience in conducting substance abuse uh, research in treatment, school bar, hospital, and community settings. Her current research focuses mainly on alcohol use and HIV, adolescent substance use, and alcohol policy related investigations. I have known Nao for a number of years, and I can attest to the fact that we're going to learn a lot 
from her and her insights. Over to you now. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, good morning. I would like to thank the organizers of this webinar for having invited me here today. It gives me great pleasure to be able to speak to you a little bit on prevention of alcohol use among young people in sub-Saharan Africa. So my presentation focuses on young people It focuses on young people and it focuses on um, alcohol use specifically and I'm going to focus on environmental factors in the prevention of alcohol use. I wonder whether I can have assistance please, my slides are not moving. Thank you. So by way of overview, for this presentation, I have five different parts. I'm going to speak a little bit about the nature and extent of alcohol use among young people in sub-Saharan Africa, and I'll focus on South Africa eventually. I'll just mention why prevention of alcohol use and misuse matters. We all know why it matters. I'll speak to some literature regarding this. I'll then speak about environmental and community risk and protective factors and then implications for the prevention of alcohol use by young people. So this slide here is based on World Health Organization data on the prevalence of alcohol use. And I thought it was useful to show this slide to you just so that we can compare the extent of use of alcohol by young people across the globe. So this slide shows data so for 15 to... I'm so sorry, I'm just letting you know that I'm sharing your presentation currently, so please could you let me know uh, when to move on. Thank you so much. Thank you. So this slide shows the percentage of current drinkers, former drinkers and lifetime, lifetime abstainers among young people across the globe. And what we see, which is of significance, is that for the Afro region, sub-Saharan Africa, about 21.4% of young people are current drinkers. Next slide, please. This slide here shows the percentage of adolescents and young adults who engage in heavy episodic drinking. So we've already heard about heavy episodic drinking, often referred to as binge drinking. And what I Band of interest here is the fact that there seems to have been a reduction in the extent of heavy episodic drinking among adolescents and among adults as well. So if you look at the left-hand side, the data apply to adolescents and young adults in general. However, the figure on the right-hand side applies to adolescents and young adults who drink. So what we see is that from the year 2000, for example, among adolescents, about 60% of those who consumed alcohol were binge drinkers. And we see that there's been a slight reduction in 2015 to about 55.1%. With young adults, we see similarly there's been a slight reduction, again, from 62% of drinkers being binge drinkers. And in 2015, we see the reduction to 57.4%. These are all data from the World Health Organization Global Status Report. Next slide, please. So why does prevention matter? We know from literature around the world that there are numerous short-term and long-term consequences of the use of alcohol among young people. And therefore, it's important that in addition to stopping early use, it's important to consider 
harm reduction as well. So preventing the harms that are associated with the use of alcohol. And as we've heard from previous speakers, there are numerous harms, be they health related harms that affect people in sub-Saharan Africa, infectious diseases are particularly problematic. Social and behavioral harms are also of significance. So sexual risk behaviors that lead to infectious diseases, HIV in particular, interpersonal violence is of major concern, self-harm, suicidality, injuries, those are all associated we know with alcohol use and those are really health issues, health problems that one would want to be preventing. In the academic area too, school dropout is of significant school failure. And then of course, in the long run, long run we know that alcohol use is associated with alcohol use disorders. The earlier the use of alcohol generally, the more likely an individual is to develop alcohol use disorders. And then finally, of course, other mental health problems, depression and others are associated with the use of alcohol by young people. Next slide, please. So research globally has identified various risk and protective factors for the use of alcohol. And in our own environments, in parts of um, Sub-Saharan Africa and in South Africa in particular, we have conducted research over years to identify many of these similar types of risk and protective factors. So again, we've heard from a number of speakers today about the different domains of risk factors. And so what I'm going to do is rather than speak about all of them in the time that we have, I'm going to focus on the community level risk factors for alcohol use. So I'll speak about some of the research we've done, looking at community factors and how societal norms are associated with alcohol use, access to alcohol is associated with alcohol use, and various aspects of communities are also associated with the use of alcohol by young people. So the first area relates to societal norms and specifically advertising and marketing of alcoholic beverages. Could I have the next slide, please? So this slide here focuses on the role of advertising and marketing. And in recent years, there have been a number of studies which have shown, albeit cross-sectional, but they have shown strong associations between the use of alcohol and young people's exposure to alcohol marketing. We also know that a number of systematic reviews have been conducted also showing how there are associations between exposure and the initiation of alcohol use in the first instance among young people and then the use of um, the heavy use of alcohol among young people as well. So that is um, growing uh, literature and more longitudinal studies would be beneficial in our context. Next slide, please. This particular slide is based on research that we conducted in South Africa. And this study focused on adolescents and adults who were users of alcohol. And in this slide, we asked, in this study, we asked adolescents and adults to report on the extent to which they'd been exposed to the marketing of alcoholic products and brands via different media. So what this slide shows is the percentages of adolescents and adults who reported having been exposed to advertisements in the past six months. And what is of significance, I think, and worth sharing is firstly that for the adolescents who are represented by the blue bars, the majority reported having been exposed to advertisements in many ways. Via television, we see most, just about all of them, signs at, sh at shops, billboards, etc. And if we move to the right-hand side of the slide, we see that even via social media, websites, etc., young people had been exposed to advertisements. What else I find interesting is the fact that the reported exposure by the adolescents was actually at a higher level than the adults, which is um, somewhat alarming. We know that the alcohol industry reportedly do not target uh, young people, and yet the exposure was quite extensive 
um, from this, uh, what we see from this slide. So this is um, something quite significant and suggests that there is a need to address the extent to which young people are exposed to advertising and marketing of alcohol brands, particularly given that we find an association between this exposure and the use of alcohol. Next slide, please. A second area is access. So we have conducted numerous studies in which we found an association between access to alcohol by young people and their use. We know that alcohol is very easily accessible to uh, adolescents in South Africa and many parts of the, the region. There's a high density of drinking venues um, in many areas, particularly in informal settlement areas. We find that many drinking venues are located in close proximity to schools. And there's high access to alcohol has been found in our studies to be associated with alcohol consumption among young people. Next slide, please. And then finally, another area of interest in terms of community risk factors includes individuals' exposure to uh, community drunkenness. The nature of the community is also key as far as alcohol consumption is concerned. So studies have found not only exposure to community drunkenness, but also exposure to crime as being associated with alcohol use and also a lack of sense of belonging or levels of low neighborhood cohesion. So these are also important and significant risk factors for alcohol use that we've identified in our settings. Next slide, please. So looking at these community factors, it's clear that there are probably important implications for prevention. And if one adopts an approach whereby one focuses on targeting on increasing protective factors and reducing risk factors, it would seem that what would be important at the community level or the societal level would be interventions focusing on marketing and advertising, given that the levels of exposure to marketing and advertising are high among young people. There needs to be a focus on access and there needs to be a focus on community disorganization, community disadvantage. So many of these risk factors are in fact associated with some of the effective alcohol policy interventions or the best buys as we've um, heard about previously. And in addition to those three best buys, the restricting or banning of alcohol advertising, the restriction of the availability and the increases in price, there's also a need to consider the increase in the legal age for purchasing and consuming alcohol. For indeed, evidence suggests that this is one of the policy interventions that can be effective in reducing alcohol use and alcohol-related harm among young people. So can I have the next slide, please? So just as a final comment then, I'd like to um, conclude just by stating that advertising and marketing, easy access to alcohol and community disadvantage seem to be key community risk factors for alcohol use among young people in South Africa. So we need effective interventions to address these community risk factors. And there's also a need for further research in order to identify challenges associated with the implementation of effective policy interventions. Many of the effective policy interventions are well recognized and yet they're not necessarily implemented. And I would argue that there's also a need to identify and evaluate the effectiveness of additional context-specific interventions for addressing and preventing alcohol use among young people in Sub-Saharan Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nao. I'm now going to go straight into introducing Professor Thomas Wigwe to you, who is an associate professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics and the immediate past chair of the department. He is a country lead for the AU uh, initiated drug epidemiology network and is working on a surveillance system for alcohol drug use in Kampala metropolitan. 
He has led research to form the alcohol, drug, and addiction, and he has authored and co-authored a number of publications. He has also supervised several graduate students in the same field. Over to you, Professor. Thank you. I think that you might be on mute. Please, could you unmute? Thank you. Okay. Oh, yeah. So can I ask the team to show the screen or they want me to show the one which is here? I'm happy to share your presentation. I can do that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, yeah, so thank you so much. And uh, so the next, um, my talks about really the role of environmental prevention initiatives. Next slide, please. And uh, I prepared this with my two colleagues. Um, yeah, so the, <clears throat> the initiatives I'm talking, I really want to focus on are these kinds of interventions um, that can best establish at the state and local government levels and uh, supported by a broad, a broad range of community-based organizations. And some of these are enforcement of legal drinking edge, uh, restrictions on licensing business, that's the alcohol, restrictions on hours of operation, and then increased alcohol beverages, increasing the, the, the beverage prices, and other policy rate interventions. So these are the ones I'm really looking at. Next slide, please. Okay, so we have picked some of those which really um, really have evidence of uh, effectiveness. And, uh, um, and I will want to start with these uh, prices. Um, we have, there's a lot of evidence which shows that actually and uh, increasing prices will actually uh, reduce availability, reduce affordability. Next, um, the next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah, minimum drinking age is something which has worked, and there is a people have done a lot of research through this. Um, we we've also debated this like in Uganda and other developing countries have also tried to do the same thing. And uh, you know, the biggest problem is always the uh, implementation of all this. Uh, limiting blood alcohol concentration, um, several, several studies have shown this. Um, Studies by Fair and Voas, they really found that they could actually it could really reduce alcohol consumption, and um, um, and also some study recently done in, in Uganda found that um, the enforcement is really a big problem. And actually, even other end of these other initiatives, one of the real constraints are the enforcement. Next. Environmental protection, I mean, other kinds of initiatives, we have creating more awareness. There are some studies which have shown that actually um, going on radio talk shows, uh, workshops, and other social media can 
create some more awareness and hence less alcohol consumption. And there are several studies which have found out this. Um, now, reduce number of outlets or reducing the dense outlet density. Uh, this has come up in the Neo's presentation, but even other studies, it is shown very clearly that we can actually um, reduce um, the density, then alcohol consumption will reduce because um, access will have will have reduced as well. Um, and then the Tatlo, Krapp, and the Homan even went further to actually look at the to find out that for each unit increase in outlet density Hi everybody, we're just having some connection issues at the moment. Um, we're just going to see if we can reconnect the speaker if you wouldn't mind bearing with us all. Sorry. In the interest of time, can I suggest that we cross over to Rene Adams um, while you're reconnecting? Would that be suitable, Rene? Are you available? Rene, are you there? She has connected, David. So if you, if we just bear with Renee a moment to see if her connection comes online again. There we go. Let me introduce Renee from our neighbouring state of Namibia, where she is the head of the subdivision Substance Abuse uh, Prevention Drug Control okay. and Rehabilitation, the Director of Social Welfare within the Department of the Ministry of Health and Social Services. Really uh, she's an expert in the field and mm. has been working in the field for a number of years. She holds a master's degree in social work, is the yes. vice president of the Social Work and Psychology Council in Namibia, and also represents the Ministry of Health on a number of boards. Rene, over to you. Thank you very, very much. Good afternoon. I'm just having a little trouble of finding my, my uh, uh, okay, here it is. Fine. Sorry. Thank you very much, everybody, and thank you for the invite. Um, I'm really happy to be part of this uh, uh, process and this conference. Uh, I'll just share a few things, and uh, but I will share a model of intervention of Namibia that we are currently using in um, prevention. I know that most uh, prevention uh, approaches focus on individuals, peers, families, and communities. But for this uh, presentation, I will focus on communities, the larger communities, and a specific uh, program that we are implementing in Namibia that we call the court, uh, uh, court, uh, uh, court program, Coalition on the Responsible, on the Reduction of Responsible, uh, on the, I cannot see anything now, now I'm wondering. I've lost a bit of contact. I don't know if you can hear me. 
Yes, we can hear you. Um, I've just brought up your presentation. It wasn't appearing when you were sharing, so I'm sharing your presentation. If you're please able to let me know when to move to the next slide, that would okay, be Okay, I have worked on mine. I think it's fine. It's fine. Okay. So can I have the next slide then? The next slide. Yes, uh, most prevention programs focus on approaches designed to affect individuals, peers, families, and communities. But for this purpose today, I'm sharing an, uh, the approach to affect the larger communities that we've been implementing in Namibia, and we call it the court program. Um, uh, we implement this uh, uh, program by a comprehensive multi-sectoral approach with a lot of stakeholders from various sectors of society and that mean by that we mean government community-based organizations non-governmental organizations private sector um, religious outlet uh, religious communities all of that and all of them then play different roles in reducing alcohol related harm in the communities. Next slide. The objective of the court program is to reduce uh, through structural interventions the harm related to alcohol, to build alcohol abuse prevention skills, um, to build prevention skills, not alcohol abuse, and to evaluate and expand behavioral interventions to develop coalitions right through the country we've set up the coalitions and to institutionalize substance use risk reduction media next slide we have a lot of key role players in this model uh, the social workers the police officers the regional and local authorities teachers uh, family members, court committees, faith-based organizations and leaders, and then the international organizations. Next slide. Um, this program we've started uh, reduce alcohol-related harm, but we also included substance use and also give information about substance use. The court serve as a forum for health, social, business, civic, and law enforcement leaders, as well as representatives from treatment centers to coordinate their response to address substance abuse related harm or alcohol related harm in their specific communities. The court strengthen collaboration among communities and the police officers and the social worker magistrates are also involved, as well as our political leaders. Can I have this, the next slide, please? The key interventions of the court are prevention, legislation, enforcement, and expanding, expanding of treatment options. Next slide, please. We are establishing uh, court committees and what they then do, these committees, they identify key activities that that region will do in their planning and include that in their year plan. They have different community meetings, they visit schools, they go house to house, and they have a lot of other uh, activities which I will elaborate on now. The court committees increase awareness raising and mobilize communities on the effects of drug abuse, dissemination and distribution of information on substance use. This, of course, they use various platforms like the radio, the local newspapers, um, uh, workshops, training workshops, skills developments. Uh, we also, we also uh, developed an alcohol toolkit and picture picture codes that are used as prevention tools in this awareness raising. Next slide, please. Uh, 
uh, we have social workers throughout the country and they are mainly uh, responsible to oversee this court committees. So these social workers are guiding um, those court committees on issues such as illegal selling of alcohol. Many times you get people, uh, they take the alcohol to the pay points where of older people, old, older persons and recipients of government grants. So on the payout day of these grants, they are selling these uh, alcohol illegally. So these committees are standing there and they, they keep watch and they inform the police to come if there is somebody doing that. Um, new applications for alcohol licenses uh, at the regional magistrate courts, uh, which are near schools or religious places. What people do is they just put up uh, uh, beans or alcohol venues, and those uh, venues are normally near schools because they are illegal. So this committee then goes to the, to the magistrate courts and they oppose. And normally when we oppose it, they will not allow that shipping to operate. Next slide, please. Treatment is the third leg of this intervention and committees and health professionals are trained to screen and refer individuals uh, to self-help groups, to support groups, to outpatient and inpatient treatment centers. Social workers facilitate the process for the client to access a rehabilitation center. It can be in this country or even abroad in South Africa where there's many rehabilitation centers. Um, social workers also conduct family therapy in the process of preparing the client for rehabilitation and assist the client and family with reintegration, follow-up and support after treatment uh, in an outpatient or inpatient program. Of course, this is just a few of the things that they are using, but it's the main activities of the social workers. Can I get the next slide, please? This model is a, as a best practice in Namibia and has proven to be very successful as uh, community leaders and members are trained and they are working uh, with the individuals and at a very early uh, stage, individuals are identified and referred to social workers for help. And they are also working on grassroots level. If they go house to house, they have picture codes, they're having the family sitting down, talking about uh, the picture that they are showing, and then communities and, 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 and households can equally uh, contribute uh, and feel and be part, feeling part of the coalition. And the communities accept them because they are part of the of that specific community. Uh, this committee serves also as a helping hand for social workers because then they bring the client and they also sometimes follow up the client. Sometimes the social worker loses track client and then they can bring the client in. Um, this court committees also make uh, make the services of the social worker or the government very accessible and available to members of the community who wants to change their habits relating to alcohol of drug. And uh, finally, I think I have I think my slides stop here, but I can't see the court uh, promotes strong community participation and partnership while contributing to enhance the self reliance of its community members in entrepreneurship and income generating because they do that to support their work in the community. Can I see if there's a next slide? Okay, that next slide say thank you. Thank you very much for me to participate in this process. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate you jumping in so quickly and helping us. Um, are we able to reconnect? I'm Hi, not David. hearing very well, but thank you very much. Thank you, Renee. Um, we've not been able thank to reconnect, I'm afraid, so we're going to move straight to thank the Q&A session, if that's okay. That's okay. Thank you very much.
Okay, so, so in the interest of time, again, I'd like to suggest that we've received a number of questions, but would ask that the presenters themselves respond directly uh, to those of you who have sent in questions for us. Um, I'd just like to, at the same time, encourage everyone to, to join ISAP. Um, and to make sure that you understand that there are tremendous value that will be a, coming to you by being a member of ISAP. And lastly, I just want to then also mention that there is a session that is going to be taking place next week um, on the 6th of October. The focus there is going to be on treatment and recovery. We also have again a team member as panelists who will be talking Working on the subject, and I invite you to join us next week on the 6th of October at 2 p.m. for our next session. Thank you very much, and with that, thank you for your attendance, and looking forward to seeing you again at the next meeting. Thank you.